thank Pastor Osprey for this opportunity to preach. And thank those of you here today who come out to worship with us here in the sanctuary. And we thank you for those who are at home tuning in on the internet. 2020 has been a challenging year for most. Uh, since March, the coronavirus pandemic, better known as COVID-19, has disrupted the lives of people all around the world. Here in America, we saw the abrupt shutdown of the NBA playoffs, schools, universities, retail stores, churches, fitness centers, and all that was not deemed essential. The national shutdown that it seemed that was supposed to be for 14 days was believed to slow down the virus, but here we are now, nine months later, and the infections continue to escalate. What was believed to be short-lived and temporary has now become the new normal of social distancing, wearing masks, and washing hands. COVID-19 has sent the world into a state of confusion. We have seen the death of loved ones. Matter of fact, I got a text from my mother-in-law last night in Houston, along with my wife, where some family members of theirs a male in Dallas passed last night. We have seen businesses close their doors never to open again. We have seen some people lose jobs on which they had planned to retire. And would you believe it, there are some churches that have still not had any form of a worship service because they don't have the technology needed. There are persons in nursing homes where family members are unable to visit. Everybody is ready for 2020 to be gone. Left behind us. But how do we respond when the world is in chaos? I believe the Bible informs us that in chaotic times, we may rest secure in the knowledge of the protection, presence, and power of the Lord. If you would, turn with me to Psalm 46. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 46. I'll be reading to you from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Psalm 46. And it reads like this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. And though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Little background here. Some believe the, this psalm is related to the time when King Hezekiah of Judah was surrounded by the army of Sennacherib, king of 
Assyria. Forty-six towns and villages in Judah had been sacked. Over 200,000 residents had been taken captive along with much spoil. At least 185,000 troops surrounded Jerusalem and it looked like only a matter of time before the city fell. But Sennacherib didn't reckon with the fact that Hezekiah's God is the God of the living and he will not be mocked. Hezekiah prayed. God spoke and in one night an angel of the Lord defeated Sennacherib by killing 185,000 of his soldiers. You can read about this in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. There you have three accounts. But whether it's this situation, and some others think it could be Jehoshaphat out of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Psalm 46 was written out of the crucible of extreme adversity from which God had provided deliverance. It relates to anyone who's in a time of trouble or to anyone that's in difficulty, no matter how extreme it is today or in the future, it tells us what? When trouble strikes, God is sufficient to get you through. So let's look here at our first point here in verses uh, one through three. We got God's protection. Uh, verses 4 through 7 speaks of God's presence. Verses 8 through 11 speaks of God's power. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we turn to the Lord where there's nothing too big or too hard for our God. Verse 1 says, God is a, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The word refuge refers to strong, something strong or secure structure that provides shelter from the elements. It can be used for protection in a storm or in war. But in the figurative sense here, it is a shelter from one's enemies who seek to harm, destroy, or even kill. And so here the psalmist is understanding here that God is the actual refuge for his people. Many of us believe that we can have all the protection if we have money. Many of us believe we can have protection if we have all state and state farm. We get much life insurance. We aim to build our bank accounts, see our stock portfolio grow. Some even hope to hit the power ball of the lottery. But none of that can protect us, church family, from disease, disaster, or ill health conditions. You can attend the best universities and be in some of the top professions that the world seeks and that the world even needs. But even there, you cannot be assured of protection. And then we come here to the second figure where it's listed as strength. And it, it's used here to describe the attributes of God, of omnipotence. But it, it's, it's used to speak of God's mighty voice that rules over all and his powerful arm that overcomes all opposition. We saw this strength demonstrated in the book of Exodus or in the Exodus, when, 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 when he overcame all obstacles to lead Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. This word is used to convey security, stability, and safety to be found only in God. But sometimes God can choose to shield us from what's going on around us. At other times, we are afflicted and do suffer. And that is when we find that he is our help. The psalmist says that he is a very present help. Meaning that he's a present help, meaning he's not absent when we need help. Amen. Uh, You know, have you ever had some of them kind of friends where you needed help? And they knew you needed help, but they were what? Definitely not to show up. Amen. God is... He's going to show up, church family. 
And when do we need help? When we're in trouble, in times of troubles. For without divine help, we would be severely harmed or destroyed. And so this word for trouble has a sense of con confinement. It's like being in a strait, in a tight place, and you can't get out. It refers to those difficult, life-threatening situations where there's no room to even move. And so this word is used for inner turmoil that can't be overcome. We see this as a picture of situations such as a national disaster or an army besieging a country or walls of a nation. But in such times, there is no help except God. And so believers should seek him. God is protection or shelter from the danger of hardships. And that is who we are to turn to for relief or escape. Anybody here ever recall a time of deep trouble? A time when you needed God's protection? A type, time when you were just in over your head? You were in the water and you were sinking. It comes in the form of economics with the loss of employment. It comes in the fourth, in the form of health when one hears that they have cancer. It comes in tragedy when there's an unexpected death. It comes even in marriage when a spouse says that they want out of the marriage. In church family, we're not immune to trouble. And we've seen it now here with this pandemic. We've had records unemployment. We've had some people who had to go to food pantries and food lines for the very first time. Divorce has even spiked during this time as husband and wife are forced to be home together for these prolonged periods of time. Again, we're not immune to trouble, but the prosperity gospel, prosperity theology would tell you that we should never be sick, ill, or broke. But amen, as Pastor Osbury always says, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Joel said what? We're not immune to trouble. He says, for man is born of trouble as sure as what? The sparks fly upward. Matthew tells us in his gospel that God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust. And so when you're in trouble and you need help, whether it's a strong army, whether it's financial, military, God is your refuge and strength for protection. And he comes to verses 2 and 3. He says, therefore, since God, what, is our refuge. We will not fear. God's protection guards us against fear. Therefore, and when it's therefore, what are you supposed to do with therefore? You what's supposed to see what therefore is therefore. Right? So that means you go back to what proceeds. Amen, Brother Alex and my DTS family there. Hey, Sister Amy. <laughs> Therefore, since God is our refuge, we will not fear. On the basis of these truths about God's provision, the people of God are reminded that they need not fear if the whole world were to be coming down. And so this affirmation of confidence is clear from verse 1. If God is a strong refuge, if he does give help in times of troubles, then there is nothing to fear. Imagine in the face of national calamity, the people encouraging each other, we shall not fear, for God is our refuge. Can you imagine that chant? We shall not fear, we shall not fear, for God is our refuge. 
But here, everybody, we got a description of a calamity that's very intense. What does it say here? Though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Everybody, this all appears to be descriptions of a possible calamity of nature with earthquakes, tidal waves, and the erosion of mountains into the sea. Of all the parts of nature, mountains are considered the most secure and the most unmovable. To imagine them shaking and slipping into the sea is a terrifying thought. And so the description here, everybody, is of a national disaster, something that's chaos. The sea itself is often the symbol of chaos and full of dangers and death. You remember Jonah on the waters. Nevertheless, God is greater than all the forces of nature, even the deep. You can place your confidence in the sovereign Lord who created the heavens and the earth. We'll go back to Genesis 1-1. He who is the, he's the one who controls nature by his powerful word, the one who can shelter his people in the floods and fires and earthquakes. The psalmist wants us to understand that these forces of chaos that threaten us need not make us fear, for God conquered create chaos in creation. God's order emerged from chaos. We also see God's control of chaotic waters by which he conquered Pharaoh and he redeemed his people. And so this psalm shows very extreme conditions, but we must all admit sometimes the weight of the world can come crashing down on us. And sometimes it feels like the world is spinning out of control, and no, I'm not saying the Christian life is easy. We're not insulated from problems. And maybe you're going through something right now that nobody has even a clue about. You know, I've had, I have a friend, he's a best friend, man. He's had cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, four times. Every year he goes back to the doctor for a review. And when I talk to him, he's always nervous regarding doing scans again. And he can be a little on edge. I then think of the single mom who is left with her children and to fend alone because the husband has abandoned her. I think of the recent college grads who've went to school and studied and worked hard and have found it hard and difficult to find a job. There's the father or the child who never had the father in his life who wakes with daddy pain. Somewhere someone is losing a home. About six weeks ago, I saw a home in my neighborhood where everything was set out. There were about eight people from the sheriff's department, maybe eight to 12 officers, and all their stuff was set out of this home that they paid a lot of money for. And I looked up, and a neighbor across the street took them in, but it appears that whoever has the house now, they, they had to look across the street and see contractors coming in daily, making improvements and redoing the house, and now a new neighbor is there. Somewhere someone has an aging parent that they can't even care for right now and as their health continues to decline. But all these situations point to being overwhelmed. And you feel like the earth has been removed from under your feet. 
Remember, we have God's protection. Next, we want to look at God's presence in verses 4 through 7, because God is in our midst. Verse 4 says, uh, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth melted, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. This river and this city, the city of God is Jerusalem, and this holy place is speaking of the temple, that's where the Most High dwells. In verse 1, it was God himself who was portrayed as a source of protection. Now it's the city of God which is in the immediate location of protection. God is in the midst of her. And so in this setting, this river, verse 4, is the stream of Siloam. The, the, the only natural supply of fresh water in Jerusalem. And I want to say something about it. The reason they had the supply of water is because of King Hezekiah. He had built these underground tunnels for the most part where he was able to take water from Gihon and have it come into the river or the stream Siloam. And so as Sennacherib and his army would have been outside the gates, they figured that the nation would soon have to give in because they would run out of their water supply, but they never did. And therefore, that's why what? This stream continued to flow and refresh them. And this stream is also a picture of what? The Holy Spirit, who is the resource for you and I. Amen? And I want you to read something here in Second Kings, and I'm about to have to close real quick but in second kings chapter 18 and 19 what i want i want us to see a picture of when this particular act or when did god give defense to jerusalem turn in your bible real quick to second kings chapter 19 i'm gonna read from verse 14 Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. This basically is a response of Hezekiah because Sennacherib had sent his lieutenant, Rabshakeh, who was outside the gates taunting the nation. I can't read all of it to you, but read 2 Kings chapters 19, please, and, 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 and 20. I can't read it all to you. But he had been out there taunting and basically the people were getting discouraged and they came and they told Hezekiah uh, this letter that was sent from Sennacherib, verse 14. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers, read it, and he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, O God, I pray Deliver us from this hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Look at verses 34 through 37 now that I'm saying that same passage of chapter 19. Verse 34, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my, and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened, verse 35, that That night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. There he had his 
He showed his presence. And he speaks regarding the Lord of hosts and the armies. And I'm not going to be able to deal with that. And then last in verses 8 through 11, I just want to say something regarding God's power. I just want to say something real quick regarding God's power. In verses 8 through 11, when he says, Come behold the works of the Lord who has brought desolation to the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Cease striving and know that I'm God. God is basically saying to the nation, cease and desist. And what he's really saying, everybody, and what we got to come to understand is when God is speaking here, although uh, something happened there in Jerusalem, this is really something uh, moving forward to future fulfillment when God is going to come and judge the nations. Turn to Psalm 2, and I just want you to see that technically the war to end all wars is going to be the war when Jesus Christ comes back to defend Jerusalem. Everybody realizes that everything is going to happen and take place. Everything, there's going to be a large regathering in the nation of Israel. And, and Jesus Christ is going to come back and defend them himself. Just look at Psalm chapter 2 with me real quick. Y'all got Psalm 2? Okay. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devise in a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Everybody, ultimately, the war to end all wars, although uh, we may think it's something with nations, technically, everybody, it's really mankind going against God. And what he's saying is, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. And so we come back to, we can be confident in chaos because we know who our refuge and strength is. We can be confident in chaos, realize that God has mastered the chaos. He mastered the chaos when he took what was formless and void and fashioned it in Genesis 1, amen? God mastered chaos when he opened the Red Sea and he allowed the Hebrews to cross the Red Sea on dry land. God mastered chaos when he placed borders around the water. God mastered chaos when it was dark on earth and he said, let there be light. God mastered chaos when he was asleep on the boat with his disciples and they awoke him and he got up and he spoke to the wind and the waves and said, what? Peace. Be still. And then God mastered chaos, church family, when he conquered death at Cal Calvary. He died and he rose again, never what? To die again. Church family, because God is our refuge, we can be confident in chaos. God bless you.